Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand in the house on this fine Wednesday evening. Let's just give God a round of applause and some praise for what he's done this week. I don't know about y'all, but this has been a trying week for me. But I want to tell you what my Bible says whenever I read it, that this is the rest whereby the weary can rest. Whenever we come together, whenever we get a hold of the presence of God, we can find that rest that's going to help us get through the rest of the week. And that's what we're here for tonight, to get a little bit of a recharge. So let's all worship tonight as we're here in this service. somebody would really praise the Lord in this house tonight. 
I wish you would praise him like your miracle is just right on the other side of your next shout. I wish somebody would praise him just like he's going to come into this place right now and deliver you from whatever it is that it may be. I want to tell you, church, there is no better song that we can sing whenever we're singing about a breakthrough right as we're going into prayer, Brother Blake. Whatever you might need, if you have a need, just raise your hand in the house and let it be made known. And we're going to pray together as a unified body, coming together, seeking after God. So if you would pray with me right now, church, over all these needs that we have. I've seen a lot of hands raised in the house tonight. We know that God is a busy God, but He's not too busy that He doesn't know our needs and our desires. But I want to tell you right now as we pray, I'm really believing for miracles in this house tonight. God, we want to just come to you right now, Lord, to seek after your face. Seek you first. That's what we're going to do tonight, Lord. Your word tells us to. We have to obey your word, Lord. God, we're asking tonight that you would please just hear us from heaven, Lord. God, there is sickness represented in this house tonight. Lord, there are healings that need to take place from your precious saints in this house tonight, Lord. There, there are addictions that need to be mended, Lord. There are things that, that we don't even know about that are working in the spiritual realm, Lord, that you're, you're working on and we have no idea of yet, Lord. You, you do so much work in the background and then you just show out whenever it's time of need for us, Lord. God, we're asking that you would just take hold of this service tonight, Lord. God, whatever we need, I pray that we get it tonight, Lord. I pray that we showed up with purpose tonight, that we showed up with oh, we showed up with the attitude that we want to get something from you, Lord. God, I pray that you would deliver tonight, Lord. I pray that you would set free. I pray that chains are broken tonight in this house, Lord. God, I'm asking that you would please just hear us tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray.
spirit there is in this house tonight it's time tonight where we're going to take up our evening offering and I just want to tell you there's there is more reports of blessings come in today brother David I've heard of great things happening today because of the blessings that God pours out when he opens up the windows of heaven he really opens up the windows of heaven let me tell you We've got a lot of ways that we can give. Can we get that on the board, please? We've got something new coming up soon. But right now we have Givelify. We've got PayPal. You can do that at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send cash or checks to Riverbend Pentecostals at P.O. Box 477 here in New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We can give the old-fashioned way in person if that's the way you want to do it. All the pans are fair game tonight. We'll take it any way you can give it, and we'll distribute it out and let God do what he does with it and let, let it be a blessing to others. That's what it's all about, ain't it? I'm going to tell you right now, it's not lining pockets. It's going out. It's doing the work of the ministry. It's seeing souls saved. It's seeing people making it to heaven. It's doing a good work. Every dollar that you give does a good work. If we could get the prayer up there, Sister Heidi. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, Benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come and give, church.
could have all the kids and children's church come line up across the front, please. Transition into the main part of our service. Got a pretty good crew tonight. Sister Kristen, go ahead and lead them on back. Riverbend ignited. You guys can go on back. Everybody else that's out here, let's welcome our pastor to the pulpit. I'm sure he's got a word for us tonight, but I'm not going to tell you how many pages it is. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Shout unto God for the victory. Shannon's handing out the papers, and uh, we uh, moving into to part nine of the bait of Satan. I uh, I was concerned early in the week that perhaps we we're getting tired of it, and uh, because uh, uh, it seemed like just because this says part nine, it don't mean we only been on it nine weeks. <laughs> We've been on it a, a, a day or two longer than that, but. Uh, uh, we have had some interruptions, and uh, but uh, I want you to know tonight is possibly, I, I don't know if it's the most important, but tonight will be a, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Tonight will be a uh, breakover moment. This lesson, maybe tonight, next week, hopefully we'll have it done in two weeks. Uh, hold on to your handouts. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I understand there's some that don't get a handout. And if I could encourage you to get one, I'd like to because uh, it's something that you, uh, and it's not just to follow along in Bible study, but it's something to take home with you, make some notes, go back and watch it again. Hello. We still here? All right. Dave and Jennifer came in, so everything's all good as soon as Ronnie gets here. Uh, I, I try to tell myself, don't turn around, don't turn around, don't turn around, don't turn around, because I start thinking, where's this one? Where's that one? I saw Lacey come in, and then I saw Melissa and Trish and, and uh, different ones coming in, and I'm like, okay, it's going to be all right. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, I, I kind of do roll in my head. That's what I kind of do. I kind of keep track of things in my head. We got a new computer program we've just started using, and it's going to provide us a way to actually do attendance and, and uh, as individuals. So, but everybody got your handouts now. Um, this this one's this is going to be uh, it's going to be important. Um, I, I don't want to get in a hurry. Uh, matter of fact, I sent a message out to some of our uh, ministry team and, and others asking about, uh, you know, just because I I was going to decide that I would, we got 14 chapters all together, so there's six left. And, and so I, I decided I was just going to do one chapter a week. And then I, this is what I was doing at Barnes & Noble. And I promise you I was there five hours. And I have 12 pages of notes from chapter 9. And uh, uh, don't worry, I'm just going to take my time. And uh, I'm going to let us wade through this. But we've been dealing with offense. And offense is the bait of Satan. And you're probably never more danger, in more danger than when you get offended 
at the Lord and you get offended at his word and I'm going to take it another level and I know it seems self-serving but when you get offended at the man of God you're in a dangerous place and it's only up to us to decide how we handle that um, it, uh, you're going to see in your handout it's, it's nothing new. Uh, we like to throw rocks, no pun intended, at the people that mistreated Jesus during his ministry. But if we get honest, uh, and I'm going to say something publicly. I brag on Sister Crystal quite a lot, but I'm going to do it again. She, she began to open up a little bit at the end of Elements class. And when she began to speak, there was a shift that took place in the whole room. The whole room. And at the end, when she went, whoo, that felt good to say. It was like the Holy Ghost just put this stamp on it and said, that's what I've been waiting on. And it's not my intention, but this stuff is all flowing together. Y'all notice that? Elements and the bait of Satan, they come from two different places, but they're flowing together. First Peter chapter 2. Verses 6 through 8 in the New King James Version. It's not much different than your King James. It says, therefore it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I want to stop real quick before I go any further. Let's pray. Let's pray real quick and just prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the word uh, no matter what it does to us. Amen? Amen. We got to receive it and if necessary, adjust. Sometimes the word is fine-tuning, and sometimes it's rough sandpaper. You don't know what I mean by that? So I want us to pray. I just I felt it earlier, and I said, ah, we don't usually do that. And then I started reading, and it's like the Holy Ghost said, you better stop and pray. So I'm going to stop and pray. But we're praying for ourselves. Okay? Pray for ourselves to receive the word. Pray for ourselves to let the, um, the a movie of our life go and look back and see when this happened and what it did to us versus what it should have done to us. Has anybody ever got upset at the preaching? Yeah, some folks is lying right in church. It's supposed to upset you every now and again. It's supposed to make you say, man, so let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, God, let my ground be clean and let it be good ground that the word falls on. I don't want it by the wayside. I don't want the cares of life choking it out, I, the thorns. I, I don't want it to fall on the rocky, stony ground, but let it fall on good ground, Lord, and take up good bedding and good root. I pray, God, that whatever's said tonight, Lord, in the middle of this, as I preach it, as I, I teach this lesson, God, I, I, I pray that it hits me, hits me hard, and, and hits me where I need to be hit at, Lord. I pray that it does what needs to be done in me. Fix me, Lord. Fix me, Lord. Anything you see in me that's not right, I pray, God, that you'll perfect it and use your word to do it. It is forever settled in heaven. It's the most powerful tool that we have. The most consistent tool that we have is your word and let it minister to us in Jesus' name. Let's read again. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion. That's simply referring to the city of God, the place God has chosen. I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Now I looked up that word shame and I, I'm going to just throw this at you a little bit because I think it paints a picture. Um, it's got a lot of different definitions. But the one that I drew out from it that fits here is if you believe in the chief cornerstone, the unshakable standard of Jesus Christ. That word ashamed is connected to, and I, this is GL's word, okay? This is Pastor GL's word. It's connected to being flustered. Y'all know what I mean by that? And it's, it's kind of like when you're about to be caught doing something you shouldn't do, and all of a sudden your blood pressure goes up, you start rattling like a rock in a tin can. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, that's, that's what that means. 
If you trust in the Lord, you'll never be uncertain. You'll never be discombobulated, but you'll be confident. Therefore, verse 7, this is important. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, valuable. But to those who are disobedient, or the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. The repercussions for being disobedient to the word are forever settled in heaven. That's what that means, to which they were also appointed. I just want to throw that out there. It does not mean that predestination, that your, your end has already been decided. It means that if you don't believe, there's only one end for you, and it's settled. Okay, not ever going to be a time when the Lord looks at the clock and says, boy, it's getting close, I'm going to start grading on the curve. It's not happening. Okay, now Jesus did not and will not compromise truth in order to keep people from being offended. Did not, and that convicts me. Because for me, the most difficult part of pastoring has been preaching truth when you know it's upsetting folks. And unfortunately, some folks are more susceptible to being upset than others. Hallelujah. Now let's talk about believing versus disobedient. Because I'm going to really deal with some things. And I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw down some strongholds of religious tradition. Okay? The two contrasting states, the state these people are in, of this passage are, number one, those who believe, and number two, those who are disobedient. Not just unbelief, but those who believe and then those who are disobedient. Now, in the religious world, and I use that term in the broadest sense, believe has been reduced to a simple mental assent, which means I believe Jesus existed, I believe he died on the cross, so I'm saved. No. No. It's not true. It's not true. We have what is a general acceptance of a diminished belief in the religious world. And all that was done is people trying to make the way more broad. It's not, it's narrow. Okay, and if just to believe saves you, let's look at James chapter 2 and number 19 and then talk about that. It said, thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. That word tremble is not just a fearful tremble, but a respect tremble. They know who Jesus is. So if simply to believe on Jesus Christ saves you, then the devils must be saved. Make sense? If simple belief, just making a mental ascent, remember I told you all about that funeral I was at and the lady got up to preach the funeral and said, I just want to let you know Romans 10 is so, so powerful that even if you don't believe in your heart, but you say you believe with your mouth, you're saved. Heard it. Nobody else had to tell it to me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that don't even sound good. All right? We cannot, I'm just going to, I feel a little bit of anointing coming on me. We cannot accept a watered 
down ideology of what it means to believe. Because you say you believe anything. But if that belief is not accompanied with some action, your words mean nothing. Okay, now. If you take the scriptures above our text, 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8, it would seem that the primary characteristic of believing is what? Obedience, very good. So let's look at this passage in the same light. And I'm getting out of the book just a little bit right now, the Bait of Satan book. But Mark 16 and 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So what took place there? If we're talking about the primary characteristic of believing is obedience, he that believeth and is baptized, or he that believeth and obey, there you go, shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Where's the accompanying factor of unbelief? Believing is connected to the obedient work of baptism, and that's not our work. Okay? So before you start thinking that baptism is a works we do to be saved, baptism's not ours. It's his. Okay? So he that believeth and obeys by being baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now what's not said here? If you don't believe, you ain't going to be baptized because you're being disobedient. Come on, somebody. It's that important. Okay, it's that important. I'm not being ugly. I'm not being mean. But I'm telling you, there is a difference between saying you believe and really believing. Because if you really believe, come on, Holy Ghost. If you really believe, you're going to do what he says. Woo. True faith in Jesus Christ. Truly believing results in one being obedient to the word of God. You cannot say you're a believer and be disobedient to the word. The stone which the builders, are we all right on that? Are we okay? Everybody got on uh, believing and obedience? Bonhoeffer says, and I hope I get this right, in the cost of discipleship, which I've referred to before, and, and I, I kind of want to encourage you to get it, but if you ain't serious about studying, you don't need to get it. All right, but he says, you cannot believe without being obedient, and you can't be obedient without believing. They are that tied together. Okay. The stone which the builders rejected is a prophetic statement from the Old Testament referring to Jesus Christ. Now the stone, the cornerstone, is when they were going to begin to build a building, they would set the very first stone of the foundation was the cornerstone. And the reason why it's set on the corner is it would be the measurement by which everything was built off of. So the cornerstone sets right here and you line up on it this way and you line up on it this way which brings everything all back together. Make sense? So what happened is the builders, that's Israel to whom he came first, the ones that the promise was first given to, they considered him, Brother Shannon, and decided don't want him. We don't want our building to line up with that. Okay? So that's the stone which the builders rejected. That is Jesus Christ. Right? The message, the way, the gospel of the kingdom that he preached, they decided, you know what? Uh, don't want it and rejected it. Okay? Now, he will be, Jesus Christ will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who will not be obedient to the word. 
with regard to salvation. Are you ready for this? Salvation involves not only the new birth, but also the new life. Okay? So you're born again, and spiritually you're a little bitty baby, and you're going to have to grow up to become an adult. And that's, Dave, what we're talking about being perfect, perfectly mature, perfect growth progression. That when you're 18 years old, if you are still sucking a fooler, you're imperfect. By the same token, and please hear this right now. If you've been in church 20, 30, 40, you've been in church 10 years, and you're still sucking on milk, instead of eating meat, you're imperfect. Paul said, I want to give you some meat. I want to give you some deep things. I want to give you some stuff to get a hold of and handle, but you can't handle it yet. Now hear me right now. This is not casting aspersions. It's not an indictment, nor is it judgmental. But just hanging around the church does not mature you. You do not become complete in Christ by osmosis. Meaning if you just stick around long enough, it sips over on you. All right? To become, hear me now. This is emphatic, a declaration of truth. To become complete in Jesus Christ, you will be required to do something. Now, salvation involves not only the new birth, but also the new life. Can I get an amen? amen. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that in itself tells us the power, the essentiality, the purpose, and everything. Baptism is not just a game. When you go down in this baptistry in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being buried with him. That like as Christ was, I want you, this is powerful. I've never seen this before. I've never heard anybody preach this before. I've never seen what I'm about to tell you. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. New birth leads to new life. Now here's what I've never heard preached before. He said, when we're, I feel Holy Ghost all over me right now. We're buried with him in baptism, Brother David, in the name of Jesus. So, uh, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. This scripture, Romans 6 and 4, proves that the power of the resurrection is not when we go to heaven. It is when we're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and we begin to line ourselves up with him. You see it? Christ, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, it's not something to take us to heaven. It is something that changes you now. That's why the gospel is the death. That's repentance, the burial. That is baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. And the Holy Ghost is the likeness of his resurrection. It all hits you here. Does that make sense? Look at Galatians 2 and 20. This is one of Miss Jane's favorite scriptures. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And look at here. And the life I now live in the flesh is different than the life I used to live. See that? Woo! Let me tell you something. You fall in love with the Word of God, you'll move into a new dimension of worship. And communion. Because there's something about when revelation begins to click and it begins to work 
And it's almost like the Lord grabs you by the arm and just shakes you with his spirit and says, ain't that good? Ain't it good? When you find out another seal of approval that you've been preaching truth. Huh? This is it. The life which I now live, salvation begins with the new birth. And it ain't done until you're gone. And it includes the death, burial, resurrection, and then the Lord tells you how to live. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 is not in my notes, but it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Everything you need to live successfully for the Lord and here in earth. And I might add to you, there ain't no difference. You don't have two lives. You don't have a church life and a work life. You don't have a church life and a vacation life. Come on, somebody. You don't have a, a church life and a home life. You have a life lived for Jesus. Matter of fact, you're living for him all the other time. You ain't living for God here. Who's, I, I think, who, who said it? Who said it? Brother Richard? Yeah. He said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. That's what you're in here. It's a sanctuary. Woo. Leave all the hell, excuse me for saying it that way, leave all the devil's business out there. But in this place, huh, huh? When I walked through the door, I sensed his presence. And I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is the temple. Jehovah God abides here. And we are standing in his presence on holy ground. That's what's happening here. You ain't living for God here. We live for God out there. We come to celebrate that life here. Amen. All right. The point of tension or the place of tension that I've often referred to. Has anybody not heard me talk about that? Now, be very careful. Be very careful. Not to lose us. Not to, not to get distracted. Get on something else. The place of tension. Remember Brother Cornwell taught us, or I taught, shared with you that Brother Cornwell taught that when you're teaching a home Bible study, watch for the point of tension. And it'll be different for everybody with regard to salvation. Watch when they get to that place where they begin to have to make a decision. It's coming for everybody. There is no easy come, easy go in the kingdom of God. Everything you receive from God cost something. No, salvation's free. It's by the grace of God, but it costs something. It costs something. It cost him giving his life. The point of tension, are you ready for it? Is a point that everyone that's growing in the Lord will come to repeatedly. Remember, I've talked to you before, but I'll reiterate it again because from time to time, hear me right now, from time to time, we begin to think we've arrived. We, we begin to say, I'm going to preach a little bit about this in Poplar Bluff, I think, but we line up with that we be Abraham seed nonsense sometimes. Okay? But Peter, I preached it to you. He was there on the day of Pentecost preaching the number one message of the New Covenant Church. That's when it happened. Acts chapter 2. That's when the church was born. That's when the New Covenant Church was born. The apostolic age began. But it was over in Acts chapter number 10 when he had to come to a point of tension on a rooftop in a prayer meeting. 
when the Lord said, are you ready for this? Holy Ghost filled people, hear me as I say it. The Lord said, you can't be prejudiced against another race of people and be saved. Because you know why the Lord had to tell him that, Brother David? Because he was. He was a bigot. He was prejudiced. And even when he wasn't no more, he was scared of those that were. Yeah, after he preached on the day of Pentecost. So if Peter still need to be perfected, Paul still need to be perfected, I guarantee you we do. We do. Remember I told you about that song the Lord gave me? Preacher, don't tell me like I wish it was. Tell me like it is. Don't preach to me like I want it to be. Preach it to me like it is. You will reach the point of tension repeatedly. And I want you to hear me right now. As you grow in the Lord, it will come in the form. I don't really have time to unpack this a whole lot, but you can go back and watch me preach about it before or I will later. It will come in the form of a rhema word and a logos word. Logos being the general preaching of the word and a rhema word. Y'all know what that is? Right for you. And it may come in a prayer meeting. It may come in a song. It may come in the middle of a, pre, of a message when the Lord tells you, roll over to this chapter. Get another, get another word, get another verse. Here, are you hearing me? Get ready for the Lord to upset your apple cart. Sister Nadine uh, quoted it just a while ago. Take, if a man think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. The Lord will constantly bring you to a place where you have to make a decision to turn loose of a little bit more of earth to grab a hold of a little bit more of heaven. The stone of stumbling and a rock of offense will be a place where our love for the flesh and the will of man will collide with our love for God and his will. It will be a place, it will be a place where our love for the things of the world and our will will collide with our love of God. John Bevere said the Israelites rejected Jesus. They loved their teaching. They loved it the way they had it. They didn't want anything to mess it up. They were satisfied with their interpretations because they could use their interpretations for their own benefit and to control others. Mm, that's exactly what I thought I'd be hearing. Silence. They liked to keep it the way it was and it became a matter of control. And when the status quo was threatened, they took it personal. Hear me now, this was their job. Brother David, it was their job to read the Bible. They read it. It was a part of their ritual. They read it. Every seven years, every Jew heard the word read in its entirety, aloud. They read it. But, hear me now, please, please hear this preacher tonight. But being blinded by the God of this world, they rejected what was right in front of them. Brother Larry, they read those prophetic statements. Oh, remember what I preached to you the other day? Herod, the wise men come and say, we're looking for the king of the Jews. Herod went and got him and said, where's he going to be born at? And Brother Ronnie, they still didn't get it. They could say he's going to be born in Bethlehem, but they still never called Jesus the king. The Bible says very clearly, and I know I'm rambling just a little bit, or I'm not rambling, I'm in the Holy Ghost, but the Bible says very clearly, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And here's why it's hid. The God of this world has blinded their minds. 
so the light of the glorious gospel won't shine unto them. That's why when we, we Brother Richard did an incredible job Sunday, just an incredible job Sunday. And when, when we share with you the gospel, the clarity of the new birth, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts chapter 8, verse 16, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, Acts 22 and 16, Acts 10, 44, 45, 46, and 47, and so forth, you will say, why ain't everybody preaching this? Why can't everybody see this? Because the Bible says the God of the world has blinded their minds because when they come, hear me now, when they come to the place of tension, they refuse to make a decision. They just move the mark. They just moved the mark. It's like one, remember when I taught you, uh, I was in leadership class, that this guy come out and his buddy was aiming his bow at the side of a barn and every arrow he had was right in the bullseye. There was targets all over that barn that he had painted all over that barn and the, tar and the arrow was in the bullseye on every one of them. And he said, how in the world did you get that good? He said, here, let me show you. And he took his arrow out. He aimed at a blank spot in the barn, shot his arrow, went and got his bucket of paint, and painted a target around it. <laughs> it's like one church group. Their, their attendance was falling at a big meeting they had. And they got together to have a brainstorming session what to do about the falling attendance. And you know what the conclusion they came up with? Get a smaller building so it don't look empty no more. <laughs> True. That, this is exactly what I'm telling you right now. Instead of dealing with that tension, instead of dealing with that rough sandpaper, instead of letting your fur get ruffled, just change things a little bit and move it over here. And the thing is, that now you're, now you're going to know what it's like to turn into lukewarm, marginal, mediocre, average. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. That's exactly right. And to proactively crucify the flesh in prayer every day, okay, so that you can follow the leading of the spirit rather than the flesh or faith rather than sight. That's a very good point, Brother Billy. The old man is not just who you used to be. Exactly. The old man is the one governed by the flesh. And hear, hear me. Thank you, Brother Billy. That's a great point. He's going to pop his head up after you get the Holy Ghost. Huh? Now, is this as far as you got, Sister Heidi? Okay. Okay, cool. I gave her too much to try to get in there. Uh, he, Jesus told the Pharisees, John 5 and 39, he said, you search the scriptures because you think you find the key to eternal life in them. And it is those scriptures that testify of me. The same scriptures you read as a way of life, it's there, but you're not getting it. Why are we not getting it? Why do we not get anything? And why do we refuse to obey it, Brother Shannon? Because it does not align with what our flesh wants. So I just say no. 
And, and you know how it manifests? I get mad at the preacher. I get mad at the Lord. I get mad at the one I used to sit next to and I move plumb over here. And I cross my arms and I stick out my lip. And every time they testify, I give them the old evil eye. Because I want everybody to know that they done made me mad. But the truth is, the word slapped you upside the head and hurt your feelings. And rather than accommodate the word, you just decided to move seats. Brother Marcus. If it was good, it was probably me. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And, and faith, because I'm trusting him completely. Oftentimes, when I have nothing to build that trust on, except the word of God. Now, the Pharisees, we're not there yet. The Israelites were so blinded by their desire to rule and reign that they could not fathom a God that desired a relationship and made that relationship available to everybody. Their biggest gripe with Jesus was he destroyed their elitist way of thinking. They liked being smarter, more religious, looking better than everybody else. Hmm. He said, you search the scriptures. It broke the heart of God. They rejected what was freely given to them, and the hope of salvation became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to them. Now, Jesus Christ, a close look at his ministry, shows that while he was a merciful Savior, and while he was a great shepherd, and while he was a healer and a deliverer, and he was uh, raising the dead and, and healing the lepers, opened blinded eyes, made the dumb to talk, fed the 5,000, fed the 4,000, said, peace be still, miracle after miracle, he was also very offensive to many people simply because he refused to preach or teach anything but truth. Now here's the paradox there, Brother David. He had no choice because he was truth. Let's talk about Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees, let's talk about who they are first. There were three prominent religious parties that were active at the time of Jesus. Two of them are, they figure prominently in the Gospels, in the New Testament, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the third one is called the Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S, -E -E and they are not mentioned in Scripture, but they are found in Josephus' writings, among others, historical. The Pharisees were the most influential of these three groups. Now, they weren't like from back in Abraham's day, the first time that you find Pharisees mentioned is about 135 B.C. or roughly 130 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And I read that at the height of their popularity, there was only about 6,000 of them. Now, they had a good grasp on the letter of the law, but they totally missed the spirit of the law. This was mainly because, and I'm being a little redundant here, but this was mainly because they found in a law a license for them to be elite or better than other people. And it gave birth to a prideful arrogance that contributed to their inability to receive the word as spoken by Jesus Christ. Now, y'all remember when the Lord told the the Israelites, be very careful that when you get to the promised land, you don't forget what I've done for you. That's what the Pharisees did. They forgot. And they got so wrapped up in following 
every, remember we talked about the Sabbath? And the Lord said, y'all done, y'all done got me mixed up. Him and the disciples ate on the Sabbath, peeled some ears of corn off and ate. He said, Sabbath, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for the man. But the Pharisees, they got a hold of that. Jesus messed around and healed a bunch of people on the Sabbath, and that was their number one argument against him. You can do this six days a week. Why you won't do it on the Sabbath? They said that. Okay. And their arrogance contributed to their inability to receive the word as spoken by Jesus Christ. They did not have any grasp upon what it meant to be truly humble or have true humility. I don't know how far I'm going to get, but I'm fixing to wade off. His message of whosoever will offended them. And very quickly, offense turned to hatred. I'm not going to stay here, but I've seen that happen in this church. Yep, right here. That's why you better, you better if you get offended, you better deal with it. Because it'll eat you alive. On the other hand, Jesus did never stop loving them. And he never stopped calling them, Brother Shannon, to a place where they could be changed. And he did that by saying, where you are, you're wrong. You ain't right. He powerfully and clearly condemned their behavior while offering them the opportunity to believe his preaching. Matthew 15 Seven, eight, nine. He said, here we go. Y'all think I'm tough? Here's Jesus. You hypocrites. That's his first words here in verse 7. Isaiah the prophet, he did a good thing when he prophesied of you. He said, this people get close to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Said Isaiah said, he said, Isaiah was talking about you. He said, in vain they worship me. Well, that's scary. Man, that's scary. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Remember when they got in a fight with Jesus because his guys didn't wash their hands before they ate? They made it, they made it a, a matter of faith. They made it a matter of fellowship. Because the disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. Now, so he said, you hypocrites, you messed up, you ain't right. Isaiah was talking about you. Which, when, I, when he says, Isaiah was talking about you, that you're drawing near with me to me with your lips, but you're a long way from me with your heart. Okay, now. In verse 21 of this same chapter, I want you to look at what he says to the Syrophoenician woman who came to him asking for relief for her daughter who was under a spiritual attack just after his encounter with the Pharisees. Now, he first doesn't respond to her. She said, hey, would you help me? He ignores her. I preached about this some time back. Hopefully it'll come back to your memory. He ignored her. She wouldn't shut up. Then the disciples come to him and said, Hey, Lord, run her off. She's getting on our nerves. That's what happened. So then Jesus says to her, I wasn't sent to your kind. I was only sent to the children of Israel. And then he said, are you ready for this? It's not fitting that I take what's set aside for the true children and give it to dogs. She said, that's right. That's right. But then she shows him 
You recovery fellas all like this and ladies. She says, that's true. But then she shows him she doesn't come from a place of entitlement. But she comes from a place that is indicative of the poor in spirit. Who realize, you're the only hope I got. Call me what you want. Hurt my feelings however you want. Tell me what it is. I know I ain't no account and I know I'm not entitled and I know I don't have nothing. And you know what the Lord is saying? It's what I've been waiting on. I can work with that. I can't work with somebody that says they don't need me. I can't work with somebody that thinks the word doesn't apply to them. I can't work with somebody that all they're doing is formulating a defense to the word. But I have never done that and I don't do that and I don't talk like that. Instead of saying, you know what? Maybe I got an issue and I need to get it fixed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who realize I need the Lord. Pharisees didn't know it. And they got offended when he told them they needed him. When he told them they weren't right. She is convinced he's her only hope. And she won't back down. And then she says, you're right. Ain't fitting to give good food to the dogs. She said, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs once in a while. And the Lord said, are you ready for this? Great is your faith. Great is your faith. It's done. And all the Pharisees were doing, Brother Kevin, I'm in the Holy Ghost tonight, I promise you. All the Pharisees were doing. Do y'all know what, when you read Louis Lamar books and it talks about the cattle milling, y'all know what that is? Just, just basically just kind of going nowhere, just kind of, just mooing like and just going in a circle. That's what the Pharisees are doing. Really. They're just running off at the mouth. I hate him. I don't like him. He don't ever, remember, ooh, I can preach right now. Remember when Ahab, when Jehoshaphat said, is there a prophet around here? And Ahab said, there is one, but I don't like him. It's true. That's in the Bible. He said, he don't ever have nothing. Ooh, Holy Ghost. Ah, he don't ever have nothing good to say to me. You know what got to happen, Brother David? If every time we come to the house of God, the word seems like it's pounding us and getting on to us, guess what? It is. And instead of getting angry and getting our hackles up and acting like a Pharisee, we need to smote ourselves on the breast and fall to our knees before a great Savior and tell him, I am nothing and I have nothing and the only hope I have is in you. But the Pharisees stayed in their same state. They were offended at the very idea that he would tell them you got a problem. Because after all, here we are, we be Abraham's seed. The disciples came to Jesus after he talked to the Pharisees and said, do you know you offended them? That's happened to me before, a lot of times on Monday morning. So-and-so ain't coming back to church no more because you offended them. It's happened. It's happened. Some of them stayed. Some of them didn't. Some of them was just mad. Some of them was all messed up. Brother Kevin. Well, unfortunately, I think you're right. The disciples, you're, you're, <laughs> whoo, shoot that thing. You know, let me tell you something, Brother Kevin, all joking aside, we're going there in just a little while. And I got under deep conviction 
Because I spent about five years trying to reach people that didn't want to be reached. Trying to change people that didn't want to be changed. Even, I'm going to look at you because it ain't you. But it's, it might be some of them. <laughs> Even laying awake at night and grieving because they look at me like they hate me the whole time I'm preaching till I got a rhema word. And Jeremiah chapter number one, and the Lord said, boy, you say what I told you to say. I got a hold of you before you was ever even thought of. And while you was in your mama, I sanctified you. And then he said, and don't be afraid of their faces. And I still ain't always done it, but I try. The disciples said, I'm, come, I'm wrapping up this part. Are we still in good, Sister Hottie? All right. The disciples came to him and said, did you know you offended them? And he said, here we are. I didn't realize we were there. Thank you, Brother Kevin, for that segue. You and Brother Billy, I need to give you all an offering tonight. <laughs> this is what he said to them. Are you ready for it? Matthew 15, 13, and 14, he said, Ever plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. He said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. The offensive message of truth will be the means whereby those... Think about that, Brother Billy. Think, let's come back to your comment again. What you said is true. David said it. I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In order to be brought to that place of tension, you have to be made uncomfortable. Everybody, everybody, because I'm telling you right now, I don't care how long you had the Holy Ghost, the old you will still crop up. It will. The offensive message of truth will be the means by those, where those that aren't truly called by God and aren't truly committed to his work will be purged. The offensive message of truth is the means whereby those that are truly not with us will be rooted up. A true disciple of Jesus Christ will welcome the truth that offends, recognizing that we are all in the hands of the potter. We're all in, when we're in the will of God, we're in the hands of the potter. It's the perfecting process. And he's molding us into a vessel that seems good to the potter. Now, I don't want to go into this next part too, too much. And that clock on the back wall is lying to me. Did y'all watch me preach at the Methodist church? Any of y'all watch that funeral I preached at the Methodist church when the clock was broke? That funeral started at 7 o'clock and the clock was broke at 7.10. I told him one of my greatest dreams has come to pass tonight. Because I get to step to the pulpit and only got a broken clock to look at. So I preached about 20 minutes and I said, and it's still only 10 after 7. I think I can get through this part. Let me, let me go ahead just a minute. Yeah, I'm going to get through this. When we temper the truth in order to keep from offending people, we're stepping into a place where we lose our God-given authority. When we change the message because it makes people mad, God no longer puts his hand upon us. Samuel was rooted and grounded in the truth and would not but declare what thus saith the word of the Lord. 
When Saul, who was anointed and chosen by God, when he disobeyed God, God told Samuel, go confront him. And he did. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. That sounds a whole lot easier on paper than it really is. He said, go confront him. And he did. Saul did not respond in a way that pleased God. Thank the Pharisees instead of the Syrophoenician woman. He reacted like the Pharisees did. And finally, as Samuel left Saul, Saul grasped a hold of Samuel's robe and, and when Samuel was trying to get away, he ripped a piece of his robe off and immediately the Lord gave him a prophetic word and Samuel said to him in, in 15 and 28 of 1 Samuel, he said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. Ladies and gentlemen, this did not make Samuel happy. He was not happy to have to tell Saul, you're done. He grieved and he mourned Saul's fall from grace. He couldn't sleep at night. He wept and he cried and he mourned, grieving over Saul's separation from God. And the Lord came to Samuel and said, 16 and 1, how long will you mourn for Saul? I rejected him. I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Then he says, fill thine horn with oil and go. If you can find it on the internet, on YouTube, Brother J.H. Osborne preached, fill the horn with oil at the cause of the times, and it will turn you every which way but loose. A part of Samuel, hear me now, a part of Samuel moving on and staying in the will of God was understanding what the uprooting power of God looks like and that Saul wasn't coming back. Samuel, hear me right now, Samuel was in a dangerous place. If he would have kept spending time, effort, and energy on Saul, there would be no fresh oil in his horn. The horn of anointing would be empty. We cannot keep fighting when God says it's time to move on. To keep fighting when God says no is a fleshly endeavor and it will be done only by our might and our power and they're limited. You sure can. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And he had a good story to tell about it. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Billy, I hope this lesson takes us to a place where we stop giving in to the temptation to look at things through the same eyes that the whole world does and start looking at them through the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him. Jesus grieved over those that left. Don't you think for one second that it made him happy? It is. It is. And part of it was, I could, I could go on a little bit. If I do, it's Brother Billy's fault. No, I'm just teasing. You remember, I don't have it here right now, but you remember the Lord had to go to Samuel and say, get your head up, get your lip back in, dry those tears. It ain't you that's the problem. They're mad at me because Samuel took it personal, but it wasn't personal. Brother Ronnie, the problem wasn't with Samuel, just like the problem ain't with me. Problems between them and God. You, 
you can. Yes. 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 Because there was a little boy out in a sheepfold that had been fighting lions and bears and nobody knew about it. To everybody in the world, there we go, Brother Billy, to everybody in the world, he was inconsequential. But he was on the Lord's wheel. He was in the house of perfection. And when the prophet came to anoint a king, Brother David, they didn't even think he was worth bringing to the house. They got offended at David because God anointed him. And in the 17th chapter, David shows up, and here comes the one that looked like a king, Eliab, and said, you naughty little boy. That's what he said. Who'd you leave those few sheep with? But he didn't know, Brother Marcus, that David thought enough of those sheep to go fight a lion and go fight a bear for one lamb. He saw things differently. I feel the Holy Ghost moving in here right now. We got to begin to see things differently than the rest of the world does. He was a little red-faced, ruddy-faced lad, but you know what the Lord saw? Giant killer. I read in, in Win the Day, I think it's in Win the Day, where he, uh, Mark Batterson says the, 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 the David and Goliath thing never was a deal. He, he tells, he said a shepherd could sling a rock the length of a football field as fast as a 45 slug out of a gun. He said Goliath came to a gunfight with a sword. Huh? It's a different way of looking at things, isn't it? Huh? Huh? We always talk about poor little old David come running. You know what? That ain't the way the Lord was seeing things. Sure, sure. When he was, oh, brother David, when he was told you're not worth hanging out with us, he wasn't practicing to be a soldier. He wasn't practicing to be a king. He was just being a shepherd. But you know what he was doing out there? Putting a rock in that sling and letting her fly. And putting a rock in that sling and letting her fly. And then he'd pull his harp out and he'd begin to play some music for the Lord. When everybody said you're worth nothing, God said, wait till I get done with you. Wait till I get done with you. They were. That's right. Yes. He forgot. he forgot. He forgot. And the old man rose up. And Samuel told him, when you weren't worth anything in your own sight, God could use you. But when you got big, and let me tell you, you know what the indicator of that you're too big for your britches? When the word offends you. When the word offends you, let's stand. Well, you know, like, I think it's good when the word offends us, but it's how we react to it. Hundred percent. What we what we do with it. Hundred percent. It does hurt sometimes. Yeah, it does. And and, and I, I want to say this since you said that. I want to say this. If it ain't all lined out by the time you walk out that door, ain't that big a deal? All right. If you ain't got it figured out by the time you leave church, it doesn't mean the bell has rung. It just means you better go home, get on your knees, or in your seat, or however you get after God, get the Bible out, get that out, and say, Lord, this upset me. This affected me, and it's the Word of God. So let's get lined up. Let's get in alignment. Huh? What do you think? Huh? It's, isn't this some powerful stuff? Huh? Some powerful stuff. And let me tell you this too. Don't always judge the message by who the messenger is. 
because the Lord preached a powerful message using the lips of a donkey. He did. God, we love you tonight. We thank you for your word, for truth, for power, for authority. We thank you for when the word hurts our feelings and when the word upsets us. We thank you, Lord, for, for when we get a little sideways and get our fur ruffled a little bit because we know that's going to happen to anybody that's growing in you. So I pray, God, that we learn, as Brother David just brought to our attention, that we learn to deal with it in the right way. Not get offended, but get better. Not get bitter, but get better. Not get wounded, but be healed. Let us, God, be lined up in your image, in alignment with you. Order our steps in your word and order our lives and, and bring us to where you want us to be, Lord. We believe that you're doing it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, let's see. Secret Sisters drawing is next Sunday. Please keep sharing the services. Folks, sharing the services on social media is a deal changer, a game changer for our church. All right? Like it, check in at it, share it. All right? If you don't have social media, go to YouTube. It'll be on there tonight. All right? Like it, share it. This is a big deal for us. On Sunday, March the 13th, we'll have one service. Uh, we probably will put it online. Maybe use a phone or an iPad or something. We will. Do, it'll be a little bit different than our camera, but that'll be at 2 o'clock down on the riverfront. I talked to Brother Robert Henry today, and the bottom's supposed to fall out of the river in about uh, a week. It'll be down in the, back down in the 20, so the river's not going to be a problem. The city's going down and looking at getting us some electricity. We called the guy at Chaffee today. Lord have mercy. Uh, Cody Walker connected me to him, and this old boy named Rick, he, he called me. I called him back, and uh, I said, hey, I'm G.L. King, pastor of the River Bend Pentecostals. He lives in Chaffee, and he said, you UPC? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> He said, I was raised in the UPC church all my life in Peoria, Illinois. He said, I did the sound for their camp meeting. I did the sound for all of their junior camps. Yes. And uh, he's coming to set his soundboard up for us and stuff at the riverfront uh, on March the 13th. So that's exciting. And the Southeast Camp Meeting is Thursday night, March the 10th at 7 o'clock. Brother Raymond Woodward will be preaching. And then March the 11th at 10 a.m., yours truly will be preaching. And I'd really like if you can to please be there. I count on you folks. I count on y'all, okay? It's in Poplar Bluff. Poplar Bluff. I have to make myself say Poplar Bluff. The boys at the boys' ranch changed the name of Poplar Bluff to Puff a Blunt, and I still think about that all the time. <laughs> I didn't even know what a blunt was at the time, but I promise when I think of Poplar Bluff, I, I, think, I have to change it to Poplar Bluff because I still think of Puff a Blunt. Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, you will need to. I went down there tonight. You will need to bring a lawn chair. We will take some of our folding chairs. Uh, but there's plenty of room on the risers to set a lawn chair or something up. But please come. Please come. I also want to tell you it's not in the announcements, but it will be starting this next week that May the 3rd, there is going to be, it's on a Thursday, I think, maybe a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday or a Thursday, but there's going to be a community day, community work day that can, can in uh, uh, collaboration with the school. And uh, they, they'd like for as many of us as possible to be involved. We're going to help with foster children. We're going to help do some veterans do some things for some people that have been down on their luck a little bit. So that'll be May the 3rd. We'll give you some more details about that. Then there's a ladies' night paint party, Friday, March the 25th at 6 p.m. It costs 25 bucks. Please, please, ladies, please do that. All right? If you have difficulty, I mean this, if you have difficulty coming up with the $25, uh, let me know. 
I'm serious a heart attack. I'll spot you or I'll, there's a lot more folks in here that will. You need to be there. Hopefully you can be there. Friday, March the 25th at 6 o'clock. Is there any more announcements? In, in April. Yes, ma'am. It's the end of April, I think. Yep. Maybe through the 1st of May, maybe. Uh, is, that, is that what it is? We'll get that announced out. Get a sign-up sheet and everything. But uh, um, we'll finish up next Wednesday with where we're at. Bring the same handout back. What are you supposed to do next Wednesday for Bible study? Very good. Love y'all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.